Good morning. We are so happy to have you join us for worship this morning. Please join us in a responsive call to worship. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground. Let us pray. God of all creation, everything that you have made bless its unique voice to praise you in all of your glory. Even as we worship here, we join our voices to the one true song, the song the morning stars begin, the song King David danced, the song angels echoed at the birth of your son. Glory to you, holy God, glory. Let us this hour of worship be holy to the praise of your glory. Amen. Our opening hymn of praise is Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Please stand if you are able. its words when we stand next to God's plumb line? Will we be truthful about how do we not measure up? Let us honestly acknowledge how we have gone astray and confess our sins to God. Please join, please join in a printed prayer or confession. Holy God, you send prophetic truth tellers to shed light on the ways we have failed, the ways we need to grow, the ways we can be, become better. Yet we turn from these hearth truths. We avoid situations where we might receive constructive criticism. We disempower people whose voices are necessary for our own growth and liberation. Forgive us, we pray, and help us become willing listeners to your prophets, to people of different perspectives, and to those who are bold enough to practice and practice and speak the truth. Amen. God says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen.
today good to see everybody back I wonder have you ever built a castle on the sand I am sure whenever you go to the beach you do that in my situation I didn't have a beach close by when I grew up and I was just uh, like a little boy like in your age and what would we what, what would I have been doing well I was trying to build a castle with Many of my, uh, you know, friends, when we use mud, okay? In fact, majority of the houses in Egypt and the villages are built with blocks made of mud. And what happened when I tried to do this? You know, as long as you're working on the floor, you're fine. But then once you go higher, my castle looked like it wasn't on the beach, so the water didn't come and wash it away. But as soon as we go a little higher, as we build that first wall, we look at it, and it looked like the Tower of Pisa in, in Lebanon. Uh, sorry, in Italy. Have you, have you heard about that? We're going to watch a film about this, so you know what I mean, okay? Like, if you don't have what is called plumb line, do you, have you ever seen one of those? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's look at it. See that? That is, you know, see that in the middle, there is a wall is being built, and the builder, all right, or the carpenter has to use that plumb line. And that's what really make that wall be straight. You know, he always look, he, he, he continued build for a little bit, then he put it and tried to see if it is measuring up, if it is align, aligned with, with the floor, okay, and everything is all right. And in today's story, we will see that one of the prophets, God asked him, gave him a vision, and told him, what do you see? That, that prophet, his name is Amos, A-M-O-S. And Amos saw a vision of God holding, holding that plumb line. And he wanted to say something to the people of Israel. He wanted to say them, to them that you are not online. <laughs> you're not online. You're not lining up because you're not doing what I am asking you to do. And the whole thing, the whole issue was an issue of justice. They were not doing much justice to the poor in their midst. And God wasn't happy about that. Now let's look at that film. And that film, not just for the kids, that's for all of us, so that we wouldn't watch it again during the sermon to save time. Please focus as you watch that film. Uh, it's very, very knowledgeable. It gives us an idea about, about the Pisa uh, Tower in Italy. All right. wasn't always the case. The Leaning Tower of Pisa was originally intended to stand straight up, designed as a freestanding bell tower to accompany the Pisa Cathedral. Construction began in 1173, but by the time the second floor was added, the foundation began to sink and the tower started to lean. The ground at the building site was a poor choice for a tower sand, clay, and mud, too soft to support the weight of the heavy marble. As one side of the tower sank, the builders tried to compensate by making the columns on the low side taller so that it would seem straight. Unfortunately, the extra weight only made the tower lean more. It soon became obvious that the problems with the tower were too big to fix that way and construction was stopped after only five years while the architects looked for a solution. In the meantime, Pisa went to war with Genoa, and for a century, the tower was abandoned. It wasn't until 1272, nearly a hundred years after it was started, that work resumed. 
By then, the ground under the tower had settled enough to better support its weight, and the tower was leaning south, the opposite direction. Construction continued for six more years, but this time they knew the tower was going to lean. The height of each story was tapered so that the floors at the top would be flat. Once they completed the seventh story, building halted again. It wasn't until 1372 that the eighth story was added, angled north to try and balance out the southern lean, and the tower was completed. Although construction only lasted for about 20 years, with all the interruptions it took nearly 200 years from the day they began before the tower was completed. The finished tower measures nearly 57 meters or 186 feet tall at its highest side and about one meter or three feet shorter on the opposite side. Two spiral staircases lead to the top. One staircase has 294 steps while the other has 296 steps to compensate for the differing heights. Over the years, the tower continued to lean farther, putting it in danger of falling over. Many people wanted to stop the tower from falling, but they didn't want to straighten it all the way because of how many people came to see it each year. In 1990, the tower was closed for over 10 years while engineers tried to stabilize it. First, they added over 800 tons of lead weights to one side and anchored the tower with cables to stop it from moving while they thought of something better. They also removed the bells from the eighth floor to lighten the weight a little. Finally, they decided to remove dirt beneath one side of the tower very, very slowly so that it would straighten up just enough to be safe. This method reduced the tilt by over 17 inches or 45 centimeters. Not enough for tourists to notice, but enough that the tower has stopped shifting for the first time in history. Engineers believe that it will continue to be stable for at least 200 years. Two mistakes. That, that those guys did. Do you remember what they said? Yes? Perfect. Excellent. You have a very good memory. They built it. The foundation was wrong, right? And the second thing, I bet they are, because like in the pyramids in Egypt, you know, I've seen the pictures of, of that plumb line. It's been always used. Always, every time they will use it, every they build a something, they continue looking and see if it's online, all right? That's what God wants us to be. When we are online with God, we're going to go higher and going to straight up. There is no danger whatsoever that we may face. Amen? Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word that keeps us straight. It's a bath. It's really a, a light to our bath. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a great shine that keeps us in the right path towards God and towards higher position in our life. We thank you because you always listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name, and let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, a fall afresh upon us. Open us to your life-giving word. Quiet the voices within us that do not align with your will. Focus our minds on the message you intend for us so that we may faithfully discern your way. Amen. For our scripture today, our first reading will be Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people to his faithful, to those who will turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is a hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go 
before him and will make path for our steps. Our second reading is from Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line as in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent the king Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophecy there, but never again prophecy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our Lord and our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a, a, one of the tough sermons because it does have a judgment. And I am more of a, a, a preacher who preach about grace and love, as you heard me hundreds of times. I do better with these sermons than this one. Therefore, I'm not going to talk much. I am going to let the scripture speak. And yet, it does really have a very graceful message as well. Because if God tells us something, that means God is not deceiving us. At the end of the day, he's just warning us. He's just giving us a message. And we ought to listen to his message. So instead of shooting the messenger as the title of this sermon, and we will explain why I chose this sermon, we need certainly to just listen and obey. And what happened next? Blessings, abundant blessings that comes to those who listen to the Word of God. However, as we grow older, as you and I know, we become set in our ways, and sometimes we become stubborn, unwilling to admit when we are wrong. And worse yet, if we don't see eye to eye with others, we become critical of them and try to discredit their views. Some people, for, for instance, when they disagree with a preacher, seem to be quick to judge motives. They may even suggest that the preacher is only looking for a self-interest or unholy purpose than what is being commissioned to him or to her by the Lord. This time of criticism happened to Amos, the one that we just read the text from. The same criticism was happened to Amos about 750 BC. That is 2,750 years ago. Same thing that I'm telling you. 2,750 years ago. The prophet had been preaching a very tough message about God's judgment of Israel. Unfortunately, and also for understandable reason, his message was unpopular. Amaziah, a priest, so in today's text there are three characters, so you wouldn't confuse. We have Amos, who is a prophet, who is delivering God's message, and it's a very tough message. And then we have the king of Israel, who the message is about him, and the judgment is about him and about the people of Israel. And then you have 
Amazia or Amnesia, who is the priest. He is the priest in the town of Bathet. So Amazia, who is a priest, he got agitated. He was irritated and told Amos to go back to Judah. But before that, he went to the king. He wanted support of the king. So he went, he went to the king of Israel, and what did he do? He bad-mouthed Amos. Amaziah accused Amos of being a prophet for hire, preaching just to make a living. Here is the exact words Amaziah the priest said to the king of Israel. Amos has conspired against you, O king. That's what he says. Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Do you hear this? It's not, he couldn't say anything about the message because the message was true. The people of Israel were in bad shape. God prospered them, gave them a lot of things, but they turn away from God and they start to do injustices to the poor. So the words of God came to Amos. So all what he says here, the priest, he says that people are not able to bear the words of Amos. For thus Amos has said, Jurabam, that's the king, the name of the king, shall die by the sword and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there. It's like, you know, you want to make money? Go and do it somewhere else, not here. And prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Amos 7, 10 to 13. Amos responded simply by saying that he was prophesying only because God had told him to speak. The main objective of this liturgical text for today is that if we are preaching or leading, we must faithfully serve the Lord as Amos did. It's a covenant that the preacher had to make. It's a covenant that the prophet need to make on front of God to speak the truth to power. And if we are congregation, we need to be sure that when we hear something we don't agree with, we are not actually resisting what the Lord wants us to hear or do. Rather than shooting the messenger, we need to listen and to obey. Even if the messenger uh, if the message is shaking us, it's challenging our custom. It's challenging our tradition. We do better if we listen to what the Spirit says. This is exactly what Peter said in the New Testament. These are not my words. These are the scripture words. In, in 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21, and it will be on front of you, we read, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well, just like I said, you do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. It's good for us. The word, even with its deepest or... Or, or something that we think it's bad news. It's really absolutely good for us and good for our well-being because it will shine in our hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. Brother and sister, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have a plumb line 
by which we can evaluate our lives. This is what Amos got in his vision. It is the word of God with the principles and commands. And when we faced with moral choices, we must see what the scripture teaches us. When we follow the Lord's directives, we need not to fear what his plumb line will reveal in our lives. Let it be. Let it be. Let it reveal what's wrong within me and within us. So here is Amos' prophecy against Israel. So that we understand why, we're going to look at a couple of these prophecies. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built through to Blum, I mean, through to that line, with a Blum line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, asked Amos, what do you see, Amos? A Blum line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a Blum line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of, Is of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jorabam, that is the king. Amos' prophecy was not the only one that sp spoke about destruction. So th therefore, we need to look at at least one other prophecy to understand why. Why, why God was so upset. And it's almost like in, in the Holy Scripture. It's only one thing that God didn't like at all. And we're going to come to that. Amos' prophecy came upon Israel during the reign of the king Jorabam II, who lived between 785, or re, re, kind of was a king on Israel, between 785 to 745 B.C. I didn't say that wrong. Before Christ, you go down in history, as you all know. 785 to 745 BC. This was during a time of much peace, much prosperity. But Amos argued that Israel was going in the wrong direction because they sell the righteous for silver and oppress the poor and take bribes and push aside the needy at the gate. That's a summary of his prophecy. That's the worst thing that the people of Israel have done during time of prosperity and richness and comfort. They sold the poor with bear of shoes, as we read in Amos chapter 2. And I'm quoting. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. It's like God always relents. His love, his compassion. But he says there are these sins that I can't relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They tremble on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. And that's, that's in addition to being a moral issue. It's injustice issues. What justice this does to women? It's exploitation of their body. So it is again an issue of justice. They tremble on the heads of the poor as on the dust of, of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. These were the main reasons of Amos' dramatic judgment against Israel. And the punishment was severe. And here is the punishment. Now then, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. The swift will not escape. The strong will not master their strength. And the warrior will not save his life. 
The archer will not stand his ground. The fleet-footed soldier will not get away. And the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warrior will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. What a judgment. What a judgment because of that particular injustice's sin. Brothers and sisters, this is what happened to any nation, to any people, to any body, to any person, if he or she or we don't align, don't align with what God requires of us. When I was a young boy, as I said, we used mud to build a house or a castle. We were able to get the floor level, but we were having trouble making the sideboards fit because we didn't use that plumb line. Today, scripture and prophecy asking us to pay attention to the plumb line. The finished product looked like the leaning tower of Pisa, which we have seen its story. Carpenters and professional builder, builders often use a plumb line to make sure walls are square or aligned with the floor. God wanted to say that Israel's ways were not aligned with God's requirement, which was clearly stated. What is God's requirement, by the way? How big, how much of it? Very simple. Micah 6. Keep that in mind. Micah 6, 6. It's easy to remember. Here is what requires of you mortals, the Bible says, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You hear me saying that a lot. The Bible says it a lot. To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God, and the people of Israel didn't do any of these. They challenged the Most High, so they didn't walk humbly with God. They didn't do justice to the poor or the orphans. They sold them with two pair of sandals. Amos was given a vision of a straight wall. The Lord was standing by it with a plumb line. And because Israel's conduct didn't square with, did not align with God's laws, therefore they had to experience God's wrath. Amos is just one of many prophets, as I said, who proclaimed God's judgment upon his people for failing to live by God's standards of justice and righteousness. Let's look at Isaiah 1. Now, why I'm quoting Isaiah? Isaiah is an evangelist preacher. And Isaiah, in the Old Testament, was one of the greatest prophets and the most of them who wrote the most about the good news. He, he, that's why we call him the evangelist. But in his chapter 1, He's making clear that the only way to satisfy God is not through prayer or sacrifices, but through doing justice. Here we go. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes, says the Lord. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. And what is that wrong? Learn to do right. What is that? Seek justice. Seek justice. That's the right. That's the righteousness. In Christ, on the cross, as we read in Psalm 85. You know that small part that we read earlier? Where it says that righteousness... And justice or mercy or peace, they kissed each other. They kissed each other. They united together. Mercy, mercy, love, compassion, and righteousness and justice. They got together in Christ. That's the good news. But if you do not do what God requires of you, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly, God will not listen to the prayers. God wants us to wash our hands. Talk your, talk, take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. 
take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widows. Amos pleaded with God, and God wouldn't relent. In many ways, God would relent. And we read that more than one time in all of his love and mercy. But in this situation, God did not relent. Instead, a blind lion put in place by God. A blind lion is a weight suspended from a string used as a vertical reference line to ensure a structure is centered. That's the good news. That's the mercy. We use that to straighten our life. And God wants the people of Israel to do such that as they always find the vertical axis pointing to the center of gravity. They ensure everything is right, justified and centered. And God doesn't want us to go too far to the right or too far to the left to lead from the center. In one of his sermons entitled, What's Your Blum Line? Reverend Joseph Clifford, who is actually a friend of mine, I invited him to preach in, our, in one of our National Multicultural Church Conference when I was in Louisville, Kentucky, and that conference was in Dallas, Texas. And he raised this question, by what do we measure our lives and our community? What tells us that things are aligned, that life is where it needs to be? How do our blum lines compare to God's? God's blum, blum, blum line has a lot to do with the poor, he concludes. It has a lot to do with righteousness that is living in right relationship with God, but also with neighbor. It has a lot to do with justice, and particularly justice to the poor. Brother and sister, in November 2012, the United States Census Bureau indicated that 16% of Americans live in poverty. One in five American children live in poverty or go to sleep without dinner. There continues to be rise in children living in poverty and more and more people are becoming poorer while the rich are getting richer. These are facts. Income inequality is worse today in America than it was in 1774. And the picture is only partially complete as, as uh, this wonderful preacher, Joe, entwined with poverty, he says, is disparity between different people and different people of different cultures. This has became clear during last year's pandemic. The percentage of racial ethnic Americans who died from COVID was much higher than the rest of the population. What we are facing today is not just an issue of race, as we may think, but also of poverty and of economic disparity. Amos words thousands of years ago still ring true and are still talking to us today, asking us to do justice to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. After all, and there is two more verses that I need to close with, and they are in front of you. The Bible says in Isaiah 117, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. So it's not just Amos, Isaiah is telling us to do that right. Well, not only the Old Testament, the New Testament. Let's look at James 1.27. By the way, there is an organization called itself James 1.27. I happen to be uh, at the um, Human Service and Clarion Center. We all as ministers went to visit one Wednesday and to have a prayer. And we had a guest speaker who was talking to this organization and to us about James 1.27. What is James 1.27 says? Religion that God, our Father, accept as pure and faultless is this, 
to look after orphans and widows in their stress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That's the whole summary. Good religion, faithful religion, true religion, faultless religion, he says, is this. It's this. Do what is right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the cause of the widow. May we do so. And I know that we do. May God will lead us to do even more and to pay attention so that we may continue to be a blessed nation, blessed people, blessed church for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are so grateful. Now we know what is behind even the judgment. It's a good news for us because if we listen and we obey, we eat the fruit of the earth. That's what the scripture says. We shall live. We shall not die. Even if our outer bodies get weak or die, our inner spirit gets stronger every day because we are looking at the city and one day we're going to get our ultimate reward in heaven by being with you and with many saints and angels who left our earth to enjoy the presence of the Lord in heaven. So, Lord, thank you for getting our attention today to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. We pray this in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let everyone say, Amen. Let us amend and let us amend our um, faith and our belief in God by reciting the Apostle Creed. If you're able, would you please stand? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We shall continue to pray for God's people in our uh, list in the bulletin. And as we always do, we keep it open on the list. And as the Lord lead you to lift up one or two or more of these people in your prayer today. Are there any other prayers or new prayers that we need to lift up? Yes, please. The name again? Landon. Landon Smith. Okay. 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 Thank you. We pray for Landon. Any other names? Yes. Yes, I had the pleasure of visiting her um, there uh, this last week, and very delightful, very smiling. She thinks that she's doing better, so we hope to see her back soon. Her husband, Max? Okay. Any other prayers? Any concerns? Yes, please. Oh, wow. Thanks be to God. Jennifer, right? Jennifer. Yes. Any others? Yes. Ah, all right. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you.
there any other birthdays? Happy birthday to all of the... Oh, yes, please. And Morgan, yes. Well, do you consider that song to you as well, Morgan? She, her birthday is this coming Thursday, but they are celebrating it today. All right. Yes, please. Who? Okay. All right. Thanks be to God. June, happy birthday. What a blessing. <laughs> okay, let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we are so grateful for all of these wonderful news of healing to Jennifer. For those who are celebrating or celebrated their birthday this week or will. For uh, June, Ms. June, for Lucas, and for Morgan. We pray, Lord, for all of them, for good health, for a very cheerful and much better year than before. May you lead them in, in their wonderful growth and in their wonderful life. May they will continue to be blessed by your presence in their heart, and their future will be always bright. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, as we celebrate and we are thankful and grateful, we also trust in you and, and proclaim and declare that we do trust you even in our body and our weak bodies as the scripture promised, that even if our outer appearance gets weak or gets weaker every day, our spirit gets stronger. I pray that those who are suffering from cancer uh, those who are under treatment, like N Lyndon uh, Smith, I pray for him, and I pray for your f full healing touch. Lord, give wisdom and knowledge to doctors and, and technicians and researchers in this area to find out exactly and to prescribe the right medication. Lord, in your mercy. We continue to pray for our sister, Miss Anita, and for her husband, Max. I pray, Lord, that the wonderful smile and pure uh, declaration of her heart as she met with me and, and the simplicity of her life be a blessing to her uh, during this time, and that you may bless her with more strength in her inner spirit so that she may continue to be in full awareness of your presence in her life and to glorify your name. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, uh, this good news that I also heard earlier about that fundraising yesterday and the success and the raising of approximately or more than $30,000. May it will be used for the support of the intended family. May, may this will be a sign of comfort and strength as a community get together and work together to support the need of this family, Lord. May you help us to do even more and to do more in this area of justice to the poor, to the orphan, and to the widows and to lift them up because that's true religion, true religion. We know that we will never go to heaven because of this. We go to heaven because of your wonderful salvation. But to fulfill, to fulfill our faith and to fulfill our mission that we need to do this, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for our nation as we continue and we all continue to strive together to overcome this disease and to show our love to neighbors and to extended neighboring countries that even beyond the ocean and beyond the Atlantic, to reach out and to show that we are a nation of just priorities, 
We are a nation that respect and love and uplift the poor, the orphaned, in their stress, and to walk humbly with our God. We thank you because you always listen to our prayers when we pray in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the cup. Amen. Brother and sister, God's abundance cannot be matched. Still, we are inspired to be generous by a generous God. We are inspired to give by the, by the greatest of givers. Uh, therefore, in gratitude to God, let us present our tithes and offering in our way out. And at this time, let's sing the taxology together. prayer of dedication. Gracious God, the gifts we offer reflect only a portion of all that you have given us. Take these offerings, we pray, and multiply them for your use. May our offerings be a blessing to those most in need, to those most vulnerable. May our offerings given in a spirit of generosity Abate the desire to board and spread the desire to share. Amen. And our hymn of dedication is, Ye servants of God, your master proclaim. time of the announcement. I believe they are in your bulletin. Any announcement? Yes.
Amen. I noticed that there are a bunch of, of yellow stickers. Can you tell me a, a little bit? And I'm sorry, I must, I must missed something. Uh, for people to contribute. Excellent. All right. So I saw three watermelon now over there, and since I love watermelon, that's what I'm going to get. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> Any other announcement? Yes. Uh, Wednesday at 1 o'clock. I send a, a word already to our ministerial, ministerial association in Clarion. I'll be meeting with them this Wednesday morning, so hopefully there will be more people to come and, and help us out. We wanted to do it sort of like ecumenical, like a kind of more hands and more churches together, and it's going to be wonderful. Thank you again for all the things that you guys are doing for the church and for the poor in our community. We are living this message that Amos is telling us to do uh, by God today. If there is no other announcement, all right, brother and sister, let's go out from this place and let the service begin by doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with our God. ومحبة الله الآب وشركة الروح القدس تكون معنا وتدوم فينا من الآن وإلى الأبد now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore